It's time for America Outdoors Radio, the show that covers the outdoor scene across the U.S. of A. and the entire continent. Fishing, hunting, conservation, outdoor recreation, and great destinations, we cover it all every week. It's your country, your outdoors. Let's explore it together with your host, John Cruz. I don't know 39-year-old Katya Rivers, but I'll tell you what, I wish I did, because I want to go fishing with her. The reason? She knows how to catch muskies. Lots and lots of muskies. From NewYorkUpstate.com, I learned Katya, a member of Muskies, Inc. and a resident of Rochester, New York, was recently honored for catching and releasing 81 muskies, and that's not a lifetime effort. That's just from last year. She caught them all in western New York, and most of them were caught on handcrafted cedar crankbaits from Baker Muskie Lures. As for that honor, that would be her holding a nice muskie on the cover of this month's edition of Muskie Magazine. Way to go, Katya. And if you're listening today, please take me fishing and give me a few pointers. This week on America Outdoors Radio, we'll be talking to a couple of other skilled and intelligent women, too. One of them is Sarah Dorenzo with Wyoming Game and Fish. She'll be joining us to talk about the dangers lurking in our aquariums that can unleash a flood of invasive zebra mussels into our waterways across the nation. I know, it sounds like a bad Marvel Comics plot, but when it comes to the Marimo Moss Ball, the threat is real, and Sarah will tell you more in just a couple of minutes. Meanwhile, towards the end of our program today, Kara Campbell with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game comes on board because it is prime time for burbot fishing in northern Idaho's Kootenai River, and the story of this fishery is a true conservation success story. We're talking about going from a low of just 50 burbot, also known as eel pout and freshwater ling, to up to 50,000 of them 16 years later. In between those conversations, we'll talk to Bob Llewellyn. He's the founder of Worldwide Marine Insurance out of Grand Ledge, Michigan, and he's got some really good advice for you, especially if you are a tournament angler, no matter what level you participate in, when it comes to insuring your fishing boat and everything in it. We'll also talk to Mike Whitlow. He's formerly from Washington State, now living in the Lone Star State and spending quite a bit of time fishing south of the border at Mexico's Lake El Salto and Lake Picachos with Anglers in International. He'll come on board to give us a fishing report from his most recent trip and let you know about these two very unique resorts and lakes where you can literally catch 100 bass a day and some of them can weigh up to 10 plus pounds. Next up on America Outdoors Radio, we've got a real problem in America today. It involves zebra mussels, an invasive species, and they may be in your aquarium as we speak. With us here to tell you more about an issue that we're getting notices from from fish and wildlife agencies throughout the United States is Sarah Dorenzo. She's with Wyoming Game and Fish. Sarah, great to have you on the air. Thanks for having me. So, Sarah, the Marimo Moss Ball, when I first heard about this, I thought it was some sort of vegan thing you put in your spaghetti if you want to be healthy. That's not what it is, is it? It's not. No, a Marimo Moss Ball or any moss balls actually are these little, I guess, spheres of algae. And what they are used for is in aquariums to create, you know, a nice aesthetic, but then they also have some, you know, nutrients in them that your fish can nibble on and they can take shelter with them. And I understand they also help with filtration to an extent too. So very popular in small aquariums in particular. However, zebra mussels have been found in these moss balls. Now, these moss balls, are they called Marimo moss balls because they're from a specific area or is that the brand name for them? The Marimo moss balls are a a type of moss ball, but there's a lot of other moss balls that people might be familiar with. There's the Marimo moss ball, there's something called a beta buddy moss ball, and there's also a, a shrimp buddy moss ball. So any of these moss balls of any variety is what we're talking about and where the invasive zebra moss ball has been identified. Wyoming identified it in pet stores throughout our state, but we're one of over a two dozen states that identified these extremely destructive aquatic invasive species inside of these moss balls that are sold in pet stores nationwide. 
Uh, that includes PetSmart stores and Petco stores, doesn't it? It does, yeah. But it's not only Petco's that sell them. I mean, big distributors online and lots of other smaller, even local pet stores sell this stuff. And so no matter where you bought your moss ball, it could have an invasive species in it. So let's talk about zebra mussels. Why is this a big deal for our listeners who don't know this already? Sure. So zebra mussels are, like I said before, an extremely destructive aquatic invasive species. They originated and still do originate in Asia, but they've been discovered throughout the United States. And what they do is they attach to any hard surfaces that can be wood, rocks, metal, plastic, and they take over an ecosystem. They take over so quickly that they can become established in reservoirs, lakes, or even city water systems, and they build upon each other. So they'll clog up pipes, clog up irrigation systems, clog up all the places that uh, we like to recreate with our boats or even go fishing. And then they can outcompete a lot of the native species and filter nutrients from the water. And once they become established, they are almost impossible to remove and they end up costing wherever they establish quite a bit just to manage that water or that that system. If anyone's ever visited some of the, you know, in Michigan and the Great Lakes area, they could see some of the catastrophic effects that mussels have had. This is a really big deal for Wyoming because we don't have any invasive mussels. Some of the states that found these in their pet stores already have invasive mussels in their native waterways. Wyoming does not, and we've been working really, really hard to keep them out. So let's talk about how these zebra mussels on these marimo moss balls and other moss balls can get into our lakes and reservoirs. I'm guessing that's when you flush them down the toilet or you throw them in the sink, or, and same goes with the aquarium water that goes with it. Right. So what the concern is, is when someone buys these moss balls, they take them home, and they put them in their tanks, but people are still cleaning the water, and it, so it, the moss balls that have the invasive species, if they're thrown outside or any of the water gets down the sink, it's possible that the um, zebra mussel can spread that way. Zebra mussels in their even youngest age can be so microscopic that you can't see them to our human eye. And so that's why it's extremely important that people follow some really exact directions on how to dispose of their moss ball and any of the other vegetation in the tank and then the the water too. So um, in Wyoming, we're asking people to boil the water and any of the moss that you might have and any other aquatic plants for at least five minutes and then pour that water after it's cooled, you can pour it on a house plant or pour it outside and, and throw the any of the other vegetation just in the trash. Want to make sure absolutely to not let any of this water go down the drain or pour outside where it can get into any of the stormwater drains or even into um, any water that you may live nearby because that is a way that can easily spread um, zebra mussels. And right now, they haven't been identified in any natural water, and we want to keep it that way. And we're doing everything we can to mitigate any of the potential impacts from this discovery right now. Gotcha. So boiling is definitely a great way to go. Other states have recommended taking those moss balls, putting them in like a Ziploc bag, putting them in a freezer for 24 hours, and then again, throwing that Ziploc frozen moss ball in the garbage and definitely not flushing it down the toilet. Do not pour it down the sink. Do not put it anywhere where it can get in our waterway. So whether you freeze it or whether you boil it, don't use these moss balls and get rid of them properly if you do, along with the water that's in the aquarium. Sarah, if there are anywhere in terms of a website folks can go to to find out more about aquatic invasive species and maybe this issue about marimo moss balls? Sure. So I know lots of states are disseminating information about this. So anyone who's listening, your local state should have information. But for Wyoming, we have this information right on our Wyoming Game and Fish homepage at wgfd.yo.gov. People can visit there and get information right away about what we know about moss balls and anything else that we learn. Right now, we're just encouraging anybody who has one of these moss balls to carefully dispose of them right away and the water. There's no way to tell really which moss balls could be impacted or not. So if you have them, consider them a potential to be a, a vector to spread zebra mussels. 
Moss balls, definitely not good for you, not good for your aquarium fish either. Get rid of them properly, don't let them get in our waterways, and keep invasive species like the zebra mussel from spreading. Sarah, thanks for spreading the word about this today on America Outdoors Radio. Thank you. Backcountry Hunters and Anglers is the voice for your public lands, waters, and wildlife. From the Canadian Yukon to the Florida Everglades, we're stepping up to conserve North America's public lands, defend our hunting and fishing traditions, and expand public access to the outdoors. Our outdoor heritage depends on sportsmen and women like you speaking up for the natural resources that sustain our way of life. Find out how you can get involved at backcountryhunters.org and become a BHA member today. The Dalton in Oregon is your base camp for fishing fun. Reel in big salmon, tangle with steelhead, bass, and walleye, or wrestle a monster sturgeon to the boat. After the day is done, you'll find a variety of lodging options around town. Need to resupply? We've got you covered with sporting goods stores plus great dining, breweries, wineries, and can't-miss attractions like the Gorge Discovery Center. Plan your fishing getaway today at explorethedals.com. That's explorethedals.com. Immerse yourself in a complete Alaska wilderness experience through Sportsman's Cove Lodge. Up to six of you will spend a week in a beautiful waterfront log home in a secluded cove. Every day is a new adventure. Go on a guided fishing trip or haul in a bounty of shrimp and crab. Visit a Native American village where totem poles are carved. Go on a whale or bear watching trip and return back to your very own place at the end of the day. Find out more about the Alaska wilderness experience at alaskasbestlodge.com. That's alaskasbestlodge.com. You're back in with America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. Let's talk a little bit about boat insurance and what kind of insurance you might have on your fishing boat. Do you rely on your homeowner's insurance? Probably not a good idea. What's going to happen if your boat's stolen or your motor's stolen or your electronics or your tackle? Well, with us here to give you some ideas of what will happen and how you can protect yourself is Bob Llewellyn. He is the founder of Worldwide Marine Insurance based in Grand Ledge, Michigan. He's also a longtime tournament angler himself. Bob, great to have you on the air. Good morning, boys. Let's, uh, let's start off with... Using homeowner's insurance or auto insurance to cover your boat, why is that a bad idea? Well, because most standard property and casualty insurance companies write traditional actual cash value policy. You know, no different than your truck. You know, you buy a new truck today for sixty grand, and you total it out a year from now, we all know you're going to be lucky to see fifty. Okay? Don't ever let anybody sell you an ACV contract on a boat. We have way too much money invested in our equipment now to take the kind of chance. And here, and I'll just make it simple. (laughs) When you call your homeowner's agent to get insurance on your boat, you're probably talking to somebody that would know an HDS-10 from a blow dryer, and that's the person (laughs) that's going to physically sit down and design your coverages. And we just have too much money invested in our equipment uh, to take that chance. I represent 20 companies nationally. I'm licensed in 48 states. I've done seminars on marine insurance all over the country and we write nothing but agreed value policy forms today tomorrow five years from now if i've got your boat insured for 80 grand and you have a total loss that's the amount that you're going to receive all of our policies include on water towing as well as on land towing so you don't have to worry about getting broke down and not being able to you know to get out of harm's way it's just you know it, these are policies that are specifically designed for what we do you know it's that simple and because i do what these guys do i fish the cabela's national walleye trail i mean like i told you before i i fished in the federation with 
Kevin Van Dam when he was handing us our, our butts on the backside years ago. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just I do what you do so I understand what you need. Um, same way with fishing tackle. You know, I mean, guys don't understand how important it is to put together a tackle inventory. But if you honestly think you're going to get $10,000 worth of rods, reels, and tackle stolen out of your boat and your insurance company is going to write you a check without you proving uh, that you actually had it, that's not going to happen. So what we've done is I went to insurance companies and said, look, you know, we've got a lot of money invested in our equipment. What do we need to do? What do we need to supply you with, uh, you know, to make sure that if we do have a theft claim, we're covered. And, you know, it's just a whole different deal. I tell guys every day, it's just simple. You know, if you bought a $100,000 classic car, are you really going to call somebody who sells farm insurance? If you're a private pilot, you buy an airplane, you're going to call somebody who sells homeowner's insurance? No. And it's a whole different specialty field. And like I said, boats are getting so expensive now that you can't take that kind of chance because with an ACV contract, they're only obligated to pay you whatever the actual cash value is at the date and the time that you sustain a loss. And you just don't want to do that. Let me ask you another question here. Now, you touched on this. A lot of auto insurance and homeowners insurance, unless you specifically have boat insurance that covers it, if you break down on the side of the road, if you need to get towed in offshore, it's not covered. And you steer people towards insurance policies that will cover that. The other question I have is, is about theft. Let's say somebody isn't insured through you. They're relying on, like you said, a boat insurance policy that somebody from the Farm Bureau or their homeowner's insurance wrote up for them. And like an acquaintance of mine, they're a tournament angler, they're in Texas, they wake up in the morning, they go outside in the parking lot, and their boat's been stolen. And then when they get it back, a lot of the electronics, a lot of the tackle is stolen too. Would that even be covered in terms of all that theft by a homeowner's or auto insurance policy? Well, I can't answer that without seeing physically what kind of policy they have, but it's very, very rare for you to find a homeowner's company that's going to provide the coverages that we need. You know, it's tournament winning. You know, I mean, if an insurance company finds out that you're fishing for money, that changes the whole thing, you know, and it's just, uh, like I said before, it's, it's you want to go to somebody that does what you do to design coverages predicated on what your needs are. And that's really, in a nutshell, uh, what we do. You know, if you guys want to go to YouTube and just type in my first and last name, uh, I've done seminars on marine insurance all over the country, and, you know, five years, six years in a row, I was a guest speaker at the National Professional Anglers Association. And, you know, guys really appreciate the education, you know, and when they're insured with us, you know, they just don't have to worry about it, you know, and there's been so many bad claims. Uh, I don't know if you know who Tony Bujo is, but you know, he's a, a full-time guide, and he had a total loss on a boat he hadn't even put in the water. And uh, he was so blown away by the way the claim went that he called the MTAA and said, hey, you guys need to get this guy here. And that's basically in a nutshell what I did. But, you know, it's just I do what you do, and I care. It's that simple, you know. And I don't want my guys out on Lake Erie or anywhere else stranded without being able to get help. And, and you know, it's like I said, it boils down to I do the same exact thing they do, so I know what they need. You know, it's that simple. Bottom line is this, folks. If you're a fishing guide or you're a tournament angler, whether you are operating at the higher levels or just as a club tournament angler that's fishing for just a few hundred bucks, you need to check out what Worldwide Marine Insurance has to offer, and you should definitely go to YouTube and Google Bob Llewellyn. That's Bob Llewellyn, Llewellyn spelled L-U-E-L-L-E-N. Check out some of the great advice he's got for you, and then get a hold of Worldwide Marine Insurance. Their website's really simple, WorldwideMarineInsurance.com. Talk to Bob and get set up for the policy you need to protect the assets that you love. Bob, thanks for sharing this with us today on America Outdoors Radio. All right, man. You guys take care. This portion of the show is brought to you by Henry Repeating Arms. I've got so much respect for this company. Number one, it's a family-owned and run business. Number two, all of their firearms, all 200-plus models, they're all made in the USA. And they're just beautiful. 
rifles, and shotguns too. The vast majority of them are lever action rifles. Perhaps the most popular is the Henry Golden Boy. It's a 22 caliber lever action rifle. And if you haven't seen one before, just go to henryusa.com and look for the Henry Golden Boy. And while you're online, be sure to ask for your free catalog and decals. If you have any questions about the rifle or anything else you see there, just call and talk to the award-winning customer service staff. They will help you out so that you can buy an American-made, straight-shooting, and reliable firearm with a lifetime satisfaction guarantee. Again, the website, henryusa.com. Another reason to check out the Golden Boys, because we're giving one away at the Pacific Northwest Sportsman Show. That takes place March 24th through the 28th. Just drop by our America Outdoors radio booth. We're going to have a banner there with a number that you'll want to text for a chance to win this rifle. Just text the number, answer a couple of quick questions, and you're entered for a free chance to win. We will give away this rifle to one lucky winner at the end of the show on March 28th. You do not have to be present to win. By the way, we've got some other reasons to drop by our booth as well. That includes some swag we're giving away from our friends at Camp Chef. And we just love to talk to you about the outdoors and what you like about the show and what you like to hear more of. So be sure to attend the Pacific Northwest Sportsman Show March 24th through the 28th at the Expo Center in Portland, Oregon. It's the largest show in the nation this year. You can find out more about that at thesportshows.com. Ready to step up to a quality-built rifle or shotgun that's a true classic? Check out Henry Repeating Arms, American-made. There's over 200 models to choose from in a variety of finishes and calibers for hunters and target shooters. Many of these are lever-action models with a look right out of the Old West. Don't be deceived, though. Henry Repeating Arms are modern, rugged, accurate, reliable, and have a lifetime guarantee. Find out more and order a free catalog today at HenryUSA.com. That's HenryUSA.com. Campers, adventure seekers, hunters, and foodies. No matter the lifestyle, we can all agree on one thing. Great food and great people are worth remembering. At Camp Chef, we don't just make grills. We create each product knowing that a warm meal is always better when it's shared with those we love. Learn more about Camp Chef grills, smokers, and portable cooking equipment at CampChef.com. That's CampChef.com for a better way to cook outdoors. Welcome back to America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. Let's talk bass fishing, but we're not going to talk bass fishing in the Northwest or the Northeast or even in Tennessee or Florida or Texas. Nope. We are heading south of the border to Lake El Salto and Lake Picachos, two places that you can visit through Anglers in International. With us here to tell you more about these Big bass lakes and lots of bass lakes, too, is Mike Whitlow. Mike, great to have you back on the show. Ah, Thank you, John. I'm glad to be back. You just got back from both lakes. I'm definitely going to be asking for fishing reports, and we're going to start off with Lake El Salto. This has had a reputation for being a big bass lake for a long time. How was your recent trip there? Oh, wow. With the fish moving up to spawn, John, I had 12 guests with me as, as a group, and we hit it just right before the full moon. These guys, uh, two guys to a boat, and they averaged 80 to 120 bass a day. And as we caught them moving up the spawn, most of the fish were in that four to eight pound range. We had several double digits, lots of eights, lots of nines. It was just an amazing trip. That lake is healthy as ever. Mike, that's what I call the bass fishing trip of a lifetime. I have actually had weekends where I've caught 100 bass with a buddy of mine, but never in that size. That is just absolutely amazing. Let's talk a little bit about the resort there. It's it's a well-established resort, but for those who have never been there before, describe it. We consider it a five-star uh, resort. You know, it's a lodge right on the lake. You've got uh, a lake view. The dining room, you can actually see the lake. You know, it's an open-air dining room. Beautiful accommodations. We put two people into a room, you know, with queen-size beds. It's uh, full service. All your meals, drinks, open bar, alcohol included. We even do your laundry for you each day. Nice. And, 
little over a year ago, we updated the boats. We have 18 and a half foot Triton aluminum boats that are extra wide. Very comfortable with your own Mexican guide. I mean, it's just what a vacation, what a fishing trip. Let's talk about a typical day at Lake El Salto, especially during the springtime. Sure. And it doesn't matter when you're down there, but this is a typical day. Uh, our staff, we're going to wake you up at a roughly 5 a.m. and bring you coffee and juice or whatever you ordered to your room. You get up, uh, nice hot showers, do whatever you got to do. We have a chef making you breakfast to order. If you're not a big breakfast eater, we'll actually make you breakfast burritos or sandwiches to take out in the boat. We're on the water at daylight, usually around 6 a.m., we're going to fish till 11. We're going to come in for lunch and siesta. I mean, we hit it really hard down there. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, about 1, one thirty, we get back out, and there's a little bit of a breeze every day on El Salto from about 11 on. Fishing really can really pick up in the afternoons for your reaction bites. We will fish till dark. We come in for uh, drinks and hors d'oeuvres and then dinner and do it all over again the next day. Oh, and the typical trip, is it... Uh four days and three nights. So are we talking about three fishing days? Well, the, the standard trip is four nights, three plus days. Three plus, because uh, some days you, you might have to fish upon arrival for a few hours or upon departure, depending upon you know the airlines that you fly into Mazatlan. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's talk about the newer destination, Lake Picachos. And again, we'll start off with a fishing report. How did that go on your last trip? Well, uh, on the last trip, we actually got to Lake Picachos right at the end of this big cold front that made it all the way down to Texas and it made it into Mexico. So our first day and a half, we were only catching 50 to 100 bass a day in the two to four pound range. Keep it in mind, Picachos is a newer lake, and so the fish are a little smaller. But think about it, cold front conditions, 50 to 100 bass, wow. Yes. The last day and a half, we had some boats, we caught 150 to 200 fish, and they were averaging three to five pounds. And it's just different lake, different fishery, but it, it's another El Salto in the making. Lots of timber in that water and lots of fish, and they're growing bigger each year. Oh, that just sounds amazing. The resort is a newer resort. Is it pretty much the same layout as what you're going to find at Lake El Salto? No, actually, uh, at Lake Picachos, it's, it's a little bit smaller. We can only accommodate 20. We have 10 small little cabins that are lined up right on the waterfront. And I'm talking, when I talk the waterfront, our outdoor dining room, when the water is at full pool, we've had customers standing in the lounge in the dining room catching fish off the deck of the dining room. <laughs> I so love we're, that. We're talking waterfront right here. But wow. It's a different layout, but it's still the same angler's inexperience. And speaking of the same angler's inexperience, is the typical day just like a typical day at El Salto? Typical day. Uh, wake you up at 5. Our staff, you know, they, they get you up and going and uh, get you out on the water. Uh, both lakes, it's the same. Just, just a little bit different fishing experience at each one. But if you're a bass fisherman, it's paradise. You know, Lake Picachos, I remember just a couple of years ago we were talking a lot of two-pound bass. Now we're getting to the three- to five-pound bass. Which one's more popular? Is it still Lake El Salto just because of the big bass, or is Lake Picachos catching up because it's a newer resort and you catch a lot more bass? Well, it's a toss-up, but, you know, folks are really, really catching on to, the, to Lake Picachos, and what we do is we offer a combo trip. So we bring you into Lake Picachos for three nights, two and a half days of fishing. You get your hook sets out of the way. You catch big numbers and some good quality fish. Then we transfer you over to Lake El Salto for three nights, two and a half days. And then you go after the giants. You can truly dedicate time just to catch the, the big, big grandes. What? And that's really catching on. What works down there at this time of year? Are we tossing soft plastics? Are we fishing top water? Are we using crankbaits? What are most clients using? This time of the year in January and February, we're using a lot of Texas rig uh, Cinco baits, 10-inch uh, power worms. The Berkeley War Pig, the lipless crankbait, has just been phenomenal for catching huge numbers. Crankbaits work real well. Topwater is not so good this time of year, but starting April through the end of July, the topwater bite is amazing on that lake. Uh, lots of swim baits, too, like the 4.8 Kitex style. Those baits, they just rock and sock them. Spinner baits, if you like to throw spinner baits, uh, that is an amazing spinner bait lake. Both of them are at times. You know, it's funny you mentioned that Berkeley War Pig, lipless crankbait. I discovered that last year, and it has become far and away my favorite lure. It catches not just a lot of bass and a lot of good-sized bass. It caught me a whole bunch of walleye last year, too, much to my surprise. It is, in my opinion, the best lipless crankbait I've ever fished. 
Berkeley hit a home run when they built that bait, and we we were some of the the first that tested it out on famous Lake El Salto. And let me tell you, seven and ten to one versus some of the other uh, brands out there. But Berkeley hit a home run with this bait. It sure works. Yes, it does. And no, that was not paid for by Berkeley. This is just true <laughs> testimonials, folks. Last but not least, we got to talk about traveling to and from Mexico in this time of COVID. I know we can get down there. I know we can get back, but we have to jump through a few hoops, don't we? Oh, yes. Uh, Mid-January, we were caught off guard by the CDC and the new travel restrictions coming back into the United States. And uh, when that was announced, my phone, I had 200 phone calls in 48 hours of customers and guests that were, you know, panicking about their trip. Right. Our anglers in staff and team, within 48 hours, we came up with a plan. We have a laboratory and medical professionals down there in Mexico. We had to find out what type of test was acceptable, what type of paperwork is acceptable to get you back on the airlines. And we we brought that together. We offer the the rapid COVID test free of charge at the lodge to our guests. And uh, five minutes, 30, 40 minutes, you have your paperwork. It's just working great. Uh, We've been doing it for a little over a month now, and we just have not had any issues. And and the folks are really happy that we're taking care of them like that to get you down there and get you back. Okay, I guess those hoops aren't very hard to jump through after all. Folks, if you want to book a trip for the bass fishing trip of your life, head south of the border and do so with Anglers Inn International. Heading to Lake El Salto and Lake Picachos, the website to go to is anglersinn.com. That's anglersinn.com. And just ask for Mike Whitlow. He will set you up for the bass fishing trip of a lifetime. Again, ask for Mike Whitlow and go to anglersinn.com. They will hook you up. You're going to have a great time, as you heard. If you want to catch a lot of fish and a lot of big fish, this is the trip for you. Mike, thanks for sharing this with us today on America Outdoors Radio. Uh, Thank you, John. I'm glad to be here. Shiloh Inns are open and ready to welcome you back. Hello, I'm Mark Hemstreet, owner of Shiloh Inns. While we practice social distancing, we're still always committed to providing clean, safe, comfortable rooms and friendly service. Shiloh hotel guests and employees deserve the peace of mind knowing that we are always focused on maintaining high standards of cleaning and safety practices. Our American spirit is alive and strong, and while we're all going through these unprecedented historical times, we can face these challenges together. Although we may wear face masks, there are no restrictions on still making travel memories for business or pleasure. So book your next stay with confidence by calling 1-800-222-2244 or visit our website at shilohinns.com. Shiloh Inns, affordable excellence. American family owned and proud of it. Why book at Sportsman's Cove Lodge? Why is Alaska like no other place on earth? It hasn't changed in thousands of years. From the way you get here on a float plane to the way you go out with the guides and the boats, it's just a professional experience. And I said, this is as good as it gets. I said, if you can't catch fish here, you can't catch fish anywhere. Your experience with us will leave you speechless. Book now at alaskasbestlodge.com. The election is over, and this is not another political ad. But with the change in president, there is uncertainty. Uncertainty in the market. Will it be up or will it be down? Uncertainty on how the new administration will handle taxes for your retirement. A new report states that the Biden administration may take away key tax benefits to traditional retirement plans. But what if there was a better way? A way to save for retirement tax-free? We can help business owners, freelancers, and regular working folks get on track with their retirement without risk and without taxes. For more information, get your no-cost tax-free retirement income strategy guide now by calling 888-585-1615. That's 888-585-1615. Find out how sound investment principles can give you a retirement where you eliminate the spend-down of your savings and create more income for your retirement tax-free. Call today and get the free guide, 888-585-1615. That's 888-585-1615. 
Call now, 888-585-1615. Are you looking to reel in the marketing opportunity of a lifetime? Then set the hook because we've got it right here for you. America Outdoors Radio has sponsorships available, and we offer affordable platforms to reach thousands of listeners interested in fishing, hunting, and the outdoors. Find out more by contacting John Cruz through his website at americaoutdoorsradio.com. That's americaoutdoorsradio.com. Hurry, though. If you wait too long, the big opportunity might get away. Hunting and fishing are exercises in hope. Before you head into the woods, you hope to tag out on a deer you'll have to field dress. Before you make that first cast, you hope for a big fish to clean and fillet. When your hopes are realized, you'll need a sharp knife. Whether you sharpen that blade on a power sharpener in the shop or a manual sharpener in the field, WorkSharp has the tool for you. Look for WorkSharp products in sporting goods stores near you or online at WorkSharpTools.com. You're back in with America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. Our next stop is the northern panhandle of Idaho. That's where there's quite a run of burbot that can be found right now and that can be fished for in the Kootenai River. This is a real success story, folks. And with us here to tell you about this is Kara Campbell. She's the regional communications manager for Idaho Fish and Game in this region. It is great to have you on the show, Kara. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Let's talk about the burbot in the Kootenai River. Back in 2004, there was literally only 50 burbot, also known as eel pout and freshwater ling, in the Kootenai River today. There's 40,000 to 50,000 burbot in the river. How did this turn around to the point where we've got a great fishery going on now? Yes, it's definitely a recovery and a great success story. So there were tons of partners involved, you know, with help of state, tribal, international and federal partners. And there was a state of the art hatchery run by the Kootenai tribe of Idaho. And so it's definitely been a great milestone with all of these partners involved to kind of bring back the Kootenai River in the area here. And so it took a lot of partners for the success story and a lot of time. So like you said, it started back in 2004. There were estimated only about 50 fish to remain, and it's a whole different story nowadays here in 2021. You know, I've heard of trout hatcheries, salmon hatcheries, steelhead hatcheries. I had never heard of a burbot hatchery before. Another question about the burbot, again, known as freshwater laying to Midwestern anglers or known as the eel pout. I always thought you found them in lakes, not rivers. What are they doing in the Kootenai River? Correct. So um, they are the only freshwater cod species in North America, and they are kind of unique. The Kootenai River is the only water body in Idaho where burbot are native. Um, And so they do spend most of the year kind of in Kootenai Lake in British Columbia. But once February arrives, they start to transition into spawning mode. And then that's when they start to move down into shallower waters um, and rivers such as the Kootenai River and the tributaries here in northern Idaho. And I understand they don't spawn like trout or steelhead or salmon. They don't build nests and make reds. Uh, They spawn in an entirely different method. Correct. That's a great question. So the burbot migration and the spawning has to be really synchronized in order for them to reproduce successfully. Um, So like you said, unlike salmon or trout, they don't build these nests. They kind of get together in what are called like spawning balls. And so the eggs are fertilized in the water column before they drift down to the river bottom. So it's kind of definitely something that's unique. Very unique indeed. All right. Well, with 40 to 50,000 of them in the river, that's a lot of burbot you can catch. And folks, these have the reputation of being some of the tastiest freshwater fish around. What do you use for bait to catch them? Or I guess I should ask, do people use hardware too, or is it just all a bait show? I think because they are a predatory fish, they do. A lot of people will use bait. Um, So folks will use minnows or crayfish, um, kind of something fresh and meaty to attract burbots. So you see a lot of people using worms and shrimp as well. All right. Now that we know what to use, let's talk about where to find them. Are you just trying to get to the main river channel and have to have a boat or can you fish for them from shore? 
You don't have to have a boat, so there definitely are opportunities to fish from the shore. So where to fish is obviously a great question. Burbit are typically most active at night, but that doesn't mean that you only have to fish them at night. Um, so a lot of our anglers recently have reported success fishing deep holes, so around 40 feet or deeper in the river during the daylight hours, and then they move to kind of shallower flats around 5 to 15 feet at dusk or during the night. Um, so Burbit bit, they tend to be a little bit more inactive during the day, and that's why they kind of go to those deeper holes in the river or the, you know, the tributaries, and then they'll move to those shallower flats in the evenings to feed. All right. So it sounds like you're best off with a boat during the day, but you can get a campfire going and, and fish for them at night for sure. That sounds fun to me. Last question. I have yet to eat bourbon. It's on my list to go catch one and eat one because, like I said, I heard they're delicious. Have you had them before? And if so, How'd you cook it? And what'd you think? I have not had them before, but I definitely kind of in the same spot as you. I'd love to try it. I hear they're great table fare, kind of a light white meat. So definitely something hopefully I can get a few anglers in the area. And maybe I can go try it myself. Well, there's something that's on the bucket list for both Kara and I. Catching and eating eel pout, burbot, freshwater ling, call them what you want. But if you want to find them in a river right now, Head to the Kootenai River in the Panhandle of Idaho. We certainly have some listeners tuning in from that area today on KBFI and KSPT out of Sandpoint and Bonners Ferry. So maybe some of you can help Kara and I get some of these fish into our belly. In the meantime, if you want to find out more about fishing opportunities from the Idaho Department of Fishing Game, what's the website folks should go to, Kara? They can go to www.idfg.idaho.gov. That's idfg.idaho.gov or just Google Idaho Department of Fish and Game. You'll find them in a hurry and look for the fishing resources page. Look for the press release and media page too. You're going to find all sorts of great information about fishing in the gem state there. And there's a lot of good fishing to be had, not just for burbot, but for all sorts of other fish too. Kara, thanks so much for sharing this with us today on America Outdoors Radio. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm glad I got the opportunity to be here. This portion of the show is brought to you by our friends at WorkSharp. And I've got to tell you, I've got a secret. And I really, really want to spill the beans. You see, WorkSharp is coming out with something very special. And we're going to tell you about it when we have Josh Warren on the air this week. But I have been sworn to secrecy about this. Suffice it to say that what's coming out is going to be a fantastic tool for you to use to sharpen any knives that you have, to sharpen any tools that you have. You are absolutely going to love this, and I just can't wait to tell you about it. In the meantime, WorkSharp makes plenty of great electric and manual knife and tool sharpeners, and you can find them in stores all over the country. You can also find them online. Just go to WorkSharpTools.com. That's WorkSharpTools.com. Check out the entire lineup there. And come next week, we'll tell you about something new you'll find at that website too. Something brand new from WorkSharp. Can't wait to tell you all about it. Turning to outdoors news, last week we shared the survey results from Southwick & Associates' most purchased hunting brands for 2020. This week we've got the most purchased fishing brands in 2020 for you. Based on 8,000 surveys, I can tell you that when it comes to fishing rods, Bass Pro brand fishing rods were the most purchased. Reels? Well, Shimano had the most popular one there. When it came to fishing line, Berkeley Fireline came out on top and... Berkeley Power Bait, no surprise here, came out as a top soft bait. Spinner baits, well, striking, they make some good ones and they make apparently the most purchased one too. As for hooks, a lot of competition out there, but Eagle Claws laser sharp hooks came out on top and also a lot of competition on the fish finder sonar front. This year, Humminbird was number one. When you're fishing, especially on a boat, you want some comfortable footwear, and Columbia Sportswear had the most purchased footwear for anglers last year. Tackle boxes? Well, no surprise here, Plano came out on top there. As for landing nets and gaffs, those, again, were Bass Pro brand ones. And for bait buckets and aerators, Fraybill was the number one most purchased bait bucket and aerator on the market. It's time to wrap things up, but as we do, I've got to ask you, have you been out fishing in the last week? I did manage to get out for an afternoon of trout fishing with my daughter Faith to some local trout lake. And I'll tell you what, 
those rainbow trout, they were flipping us the fin. We could see seven of them, ranging from 9 inches all the way up to 16 inches in size, cruising the clear waters of the lake right in front of us. And we threw everything but the kitchen sink at them. We got a few follows. My daughter got a half-hearted strike, but we just couldn't get them to commit. They just simply weren't interested in doing anything but taunting us. Oh well, on the bright side, the sun, it was shining. I was fishing with my daughter, and even though we were skunked, life's good. Here's hoping you get outside with a friend or family member soon, whether you're fishing, hiking, hunting, or kayaking, canoeing, no matter what it is. I'm pretty sure you're going to have a good time, and as I've said many times before, a good dose of nature, it's just plain good for the soul. Until next time, I hope you are blessed. Do stay healthy and do remember this. It is your country and your outdoors, so get out there and enjoy it. adventure seekers, hunters, and foodies. No matter the lifestyle, we can all agree on one thing. Great food and great people are worth remembering. At Camp Chef, we don't just make grills. We create each product knowing that a warm meal is always better when it's shared with those we love. Learn more about Camp Chef grills, smokers, and portable cooking equipment at CampChef.com. That's CampChef.com for a better way to cook outdoors. Are you looking to reel in the marketing opportunity of a lifetime? Then set the hook because we've got it right here for you. America Outdoors Radio has sponsorships available, and we offer affordable platforms to reach thousands of listeners interested in fishing, hunting, and the outdoors. Find out more by contacting John Cruz through his website at AmericaOutdoorsRadio.com.